Good choice, Reuben. And this country will stand if it remembers how it started and the perseverance that's there and that, uh, that God has for each one of us. I want to, uh, we're going to honor service, sacrifice, and the gift that has been given by men and women of this congregation. But I want to do one thing before that is uh, all that have been involved in the spinning spools, I think they're already standing back to the back, but anybody else that has, you, you need to stand up right here. Uh, thank you, thank you. Usually you met every other week, I think, for a while. But to get done today what you see over on the wall, it took every week and some Saturdays, too. Is that correct? So wrapped in those, whoever receives these, is service, sacrifice, and love. Gail, I'm going to turn it over to you for this ceremony. And uh, you'll take it from here. You're going to do it down there? Thank you. As if this isn't emotional enough, thank you for that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I am from the Spinning Schools. I kind of represent us today. I just want to thank all the ladies who have made all these quilts. Um, and we have met every Thursday since um, March to do this. Um, <clears throat> and we've had a couple made from women outside the group who don't meet with us who wanted to be a part of it too. So we welcome anybody at any place they want to sew. And thanks to everybody for the donations of the fabrics and the money and everything to do this, because these are not cheap to do. <laughs> and we are very thankful that we have the privilege and the opportunity to do this for our veterans. <clears throat> we did this in November for Veterans Day. We were only able to honor, I think, eight at that point. And so now we got the rest of y'all. <laughs> so as um, I'm going to introduce Sherry Murray, who is kind of the spokesperson for the Quilts of Valor Foundation in this area. And she knows everything there is to know about Quilts of Valor. And <laughs> as she calls your name off, you each are assigned um, a very special lady who will have your quilt. And as you come up and stand by her, um, she will unfold the quilt and give you a hug. It's called a Quilt of Valor hug. And she'll wrap that quilt around your shoulders. So as you feel that, feel the wrap of love from us, thanking you for your service and from the nation, a very grateful nation, and also just feel a hug from God because he's got your back and he loves you even more than we do. So you're Sherry Marie. Yes, you can go over there. Oh, I can't go that way. You want to go up here? No, I'm going to use the post box. Oh, right there. How do you do that? The 100th anniversary of the armistice or temporary cessation of the Great War on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month was observed last fall. While the treaty to officially end World War I was signed in June of 1919, people began celebrating in November with parades and public gatherings. In 1938, the holiday was dedicated to the cause of world peace and celebrated as a national holiday. In 1954, veterans organizations lab labeled for a name change from Armistice Day to Veterans Day, a time to honor veterans of all wars. Originally, it was to be observed on the fourth Monday in October, but the historical significance of November 11th prevailed and November 11th became the day for federal gov government observances. Compared to nations across the globe, we are a relatively young nation. However, we have established our own holidays and traditions to honor our veterans. My favorite is the 4th of July, starting with celebrations this weekend. Many think we celebrate because we received our independence, which is true, but it's so much more than that. Before we were the United States, we were colonies, actually an extension of England. Once the motherland decided to take con more control over the colonies, things began to change. 
The first Continental Congress was formed to try to persuade the British government to re recognize the rights of colonies to have representation in their government. Eventually, the American Revolution was declared for us to show a united stand against Britain. During that war, a second Continental Congress was named with patriots like Thomas Jefferson, Robert Livingston, John Adams, Ben Franklin, John Hancock, known as our founding fathers. It was formed to draft a document known as the Declaration of Independence, whereby we officially declared our independence from Britain. The birth of the United States was declared on July 4th, 1776, when the Declaration was adopted by Congress. Although the war was still going on the following year, people in Philadelphia began celebrating on July 4th. After the war ended in 1783, the 4th of July became a holiday in many places. Early celebrations included speeches, military events, parades and fireworks, and became more commonplace after the War of 1812. On June 28, 1870, Congress passed a law making Independence Day a federal holiday. Cities and towns across the nation can continue to celebrate with a variety of activities, from shooting off cannons to barbecues, picnics, and everyone's favorite, fireworks. Some even coordinated to music. Today we celebrate our most revered right as American citizens, our freedoms. We pause to remember the true cost of liberty. We are fortunate to live in the land of the free because of the brave, not only because all of those brave citizens who fought those many years ago, so we would have the freedom to celebrate now, but to say thanks to the men and women who now serve and fight at home and abroad, along with their families who sacrifice with them to allow us the privilege of living in the USA, where we can hoist our flags and proudly wear our red, white, and blue to show our appreciation to those to whom we owe our freedoms, our nation's veterans and military. Paying tribute to those who made the ultimate sacrifice grew from an earlier tradition started after the Civil War by the ones who stayed behind, the women, keeping their homes, farms, and businesses going while their husbands, sons, fathers, and brothers marched off to defend their way of life. Sadly, many never returned, and the tradition of placing wreaths, flags, or flowers on graves began. We continue to observe this tradition on the last Monday in May, known as Memorial Day. Why should we even remember or honor our veterans? Because at one point in their life, they signed a blank check payable to the United States of America for an amount up to and including their life. They are filled with hope and bravery and ready to take on the challenges of a new and different way of life with the courage to stand for the freedoms we enjoy and many times take for granted. That is beyond honor and way too many people no longer respect or appreciate that. As spinning spools, we consider it a privilege to honor their commitment. We, along with others around the globe, are proud to participate by making quilts and awarding them to veterans whenever and wherever we can. We want to honor those we know and love while we can. If we, if we can't make them, as we have done for today's celebration, we can request one from the National Quilt of Valor Organization. In 2003, Catherine Roberts, a mother from Delaware, wanted to honor her own son who was returning from a year-long deployment in Iraq by making him a quilt. She quickly realized that all soldiers and veterans deserve to be honored with love and gratitude for their service. From that humble beginning, another tradition to honor those who serve or have served with a quilt was born. Now men with women and children worldwide sew and award quilts of valor as a tangible reminder of appreciation and gratitude for their sacrifice and service. A handmade quilt is thought to be the civilian equivalent of a Purple Heart Award. 
given to those who served our great nation. It carries a heartfelt message that someone cares and appreciates their service. It's not a military medal to be put in a box and placed on a shelf in a closet. Instead, it's meant as an item of comfort to be used and displayed for all to see. Many who served don't talk about their experiences, but a quilt wrapped around them can comfort and help them through those difficult times. Making quilts of valor is a form of national service done in the comforts of our home, and it's a way we serve God with our talents. They're donated, never sold, by honoring citizens, by ordinary citizens who love our country and cherish the opportunity to participate in some small way to say thank you to our heroes. Mary Welch said it best when she wrote these words, a few pieces of cloth from people who care to honor your service, it only seems fair. Carefully chosen materials of red, white, and blue sewn together for those patriotic and true. A top pieced together with caring and pride, then quilted with backing and a warm layer inside. Every stitch and seam sewn right from the start with appreciation and gratitude straight from the heart. For you who have sacrificed for those here at home, may the quilt warm and comfort you wherever you roam. Our hope with this quilt is to make sure you knew we appreciate all you've done and all you've been through. There are criteria for a quilt to be a quilt of valor. They must be of a certain size, certain types of fabrics, have a quilt of valor label. They must be quilted and bound and awarded in a ceremony. Now quilts of valor can be awarded anywhere. They, they can be given in hospitals, in churches, in nursing homes, in restaurants, and in public gatherings or one at a time in a person's home. And I think Gail and I have done all of those. <laughs> um, in 2012, there was 6,169 quilts made and awarded. In 2013, that number had doubled to over 12,000. Last year, there were over 30,000 quilts. And so far this year, there have been 12,000 quilts made and, and awarded for a total so far of 221,785 since the year 2003. Last fall, as Gail said, we presented quilts to the first group of veterans here at the church. Today, we continue with the remaining veterans here at the Wesleyan Church in Hartford City. As we call your name, please come forward. You will receive your quart, quilt and then just kind of step back to the side and wait till everyone has received theirs. Larry Brogan. Larry was a 30-year U.S. Army veteran. He received the surround <laughs> face. He achieved the rank of Sergeant First Class and was a readiness NCO and served in Indiana. Want to step? No. You guys just step down that way. Jerry Emerson. Jerry is a 20 year, served 24 years in the Air Force and achieved the rank of Master Sergeant. He was a firefighter, a fire school instructor, and a military training instructor. He's been stationed in Texas, Illinois, England, Colorado, Alaska, Korea, Korea, Wyoming, and Washington. Thank you for your service. Kim Emerson. Kim served 10 years in the Air Force achieved the rank of sergeant and was a security police person. She served in North Dakota, South Korea, Korea and Wyoming. Jimmy Lytle. 
Jimmy was in the U.S. Marine Corps and National Guard for a total of 12 years. He had achieved ranks of corporal and sergeant. He was a field wireman and in the infantry. He served in California and North Carolina. <laughs> Ross Crawford. Ross spent eight years in the U.S. Army, achieved the rank of sergeant, and was a combat engineer. He served in the per Persian Gulf and Honduras. <laughs> Scott Malott. Scott was in the U.S. Navy for seven years, achieved the rank of Fireman E3, and was a machinist mate. He served on the USS Ranger out of San Diego, California. <laughs> Dwight Brewer. Dwight was in the Indiana National Guard for six years, achieved the rank of SP4, and was in the infantry, he served in Indiana. <laughs> Ray Flannery. Ray was in the Army Reserve for six years. He achieved a an E-5 sergeant rank and was a supply specialist. Spent some time in Cuba. <laughs> Jonathan Wolfgang. Jonathan was in Marine Corps for five years. He achieved the rank of cor corporal and was a combat engineer. Jonathan served in Afghanistan. <laughs> Steve Banter. Steve was in the U.S. Marine Corps for four years, achieved the rank of corporal, and was in the infantry and military police. He served in the Pacific at Hawaii, Taiwan, Japan, Okinawa, and South Carolina. Also, Vietnam and Philippines, and Puerto Rico for a short stay. <laughs> Travis Love. Travis was in the Army for four years, achieved a specialist E-4 rank, and was in the infantry and served in Iraq. <laughs> Scott Miller. Scott was in the U.S. Air Force for four years, achieved an airman first class rank and was in the security police. He served in Wyoming, Turkey, and Colorado. John Mark Ranch. John Mark was in the Air Force for four years, achieved the rank of senior airman, was a firefighter, and, and worked in emergency dispatch. He served in Texas, Illinois, Germany, and Florida. <laughs> Blank Rigdon served 
four plus years in the Army and National Guard. He achieved a rank of specialist and it, it, he was in carpentry and masonry, served in Oklahoma. T.J. Williams spent three years in the U.S. Army, achieved the rank of specialist, and worked as a tank crewman. He served in tank Kansas, Kuwait, and Jordan. <laughs> and finally, Lou Ann Shannon. Luann was in the U.S. Army for two years, achieved, achieved the rank of private first class, and was in the military police. She served her time in Virginia. <laughs> now, if you'll all stand will show our appreciation and honor and thank you for your service and sacrifice to our great nation. Okay, I'm gonna ask everyone to sit Seat, be seated, and after the service, if all of you with your quilt will come up afterwards so we can get a group picture of you with your quilts. Thank you. The children are dismissed to children's church at this time. And as they go to share a special time together, I want to express my appreciation personally and on behalf of the church to not only the spinning spools for this ministry and labor of love, but to all those veterans who have been recognized this morning. Words are often inadequate, so I only know to say to you, thank you. Now, my name is Barry Taylor and I'm your new pastor. It's official except for the fact that the boss isn't here yet. But she'll be here next weekend. This past week, while I was wrestling with a little bit of an ear infection and, and getting ready for the, for the transition, um, my father's last living sibling passed away. My dad was the youngest in his family. He had a sister who was the oldest in the family. Then two older brothers, Buck and Arnold. My dad was the youngest and he was a twin, he had a twin sister. His twin sister passed away when she was three years old of whooping cough. Back, 
I think, at the beginning of World War II. His two brothers, older brothers, both served in the armed forces. My Uncle Buck served in the United States Army and fought in Korea. He passed away in 1998. My Uncle Arnold, who just passed away this past week, was in the United States Marine Corps and was stationed in Japan. My dad is the last surviving member now of his family after this past week. My dad was in the Air Force. And if you ask my dad to talk about his favorite his favorite occupation, his favorite employment, his favorite time of life, he will always go back and tell you about the Air Force. His time in the Air Force gets better with every passing year. <laughs> and he is a one-man recruiting station for the Air Force. My dad's going to come out and visit, I hope, fairly soon. He's going to have a heart procedure, a stent put in this next week, this upcoming week. And then he insists he's coming out here to check this place out. Dad's 81. And when he comes, any of you who are 30 or younger and have never been in the service, understand that my dad is a one-man recruiting service for the United States Air Force. Look out. So in light of my own family's history and the recent passing of my uncle, and in light of the fact that I've been doing what's called pastoral ministry for 32 years, I know that there are some things you don't try to out-preach. And I'm not going to try to out-preach this morning. Here's what I think I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you to remain seated. Normally I would ask you to stand for the, the reading of the scripture, but I'll tell you what. Let's have less of a sermon this morning. Let's just have a short reflection to keep faith with what we've just experienced this morning. Let's do that. So, simply going to ask you to uh, turn, if you have your Bible, or if you have a Bible app on your phone and you want to start that up, I want to invite you to look at Philippians chapter 3. It's in the New Testament. It's one of the letters of the Apostle Paul. Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to begin in verse 14, uh, excuse me, begin in verse 17 and continue through chapter 4, verse 1. And if you'd like to read along on the screen behind me, of course, I invite you to do that. Hear the word of the Lord. Join with others in following my example, brothers and sisters, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. And my brothers and my sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord God, in these moments, we recognize that we have already had the opportunity to worship you and to celebrate what you have done in the lives and the careers of veterans who have fulfilled in, in remarkable, remarkable and sacrificial ways their understanding of citizenship. So we're grateful for the time of worship and for the living lessons that they have provided 
to us and for us through their biographies. In these moments, Lord, simply help us to apply the scripture and join in the example and benefit by what you would say to us through your holy word. For this we pray by the power of your spirit, in the name of the word made flesh, your son Jesus Christ, amen. What does it mean to be a good citizen? What does that mean? I know what it means for me as a member of my family and as a person who has been a lifelong citizen of the United States and for most of my life a citizen of West Virginia. Now, being a citizen of West Virginia is a whole different animal, so let's not talk about that. <laughs> but we can talk about being a citizen of the country. And this is what I was raised to believe. Coming from a family with a military heritage, even going back to my grandfather who was in the Marines during World War II at an older age. This is what I was raised to believe about citizenship. I was raised to believe that there is a whole host of men and women who over the long course of our nation's history have given their lives so that we can enjoy freedom in this country. And I was raised to believe that I had no more solemn obligation in my life than to honor the memory and the sacrifice of those who gave their lives so that I could have freedom by exercising my freedom and exercising it responsibly. And I was told that a good citizen was someone who was aware of the issues facing our country and our localities. A good citizen is someone who is informed on the issues and chooses stands on the issues based not on personal gain but on what's best for the country. And that good citizen, having informed himself or herself of the issues and taken a stand on the issues based on what is best for the country, then takes every opportunity granted to them to vote, to vote with, for candidates who align with values and principles developed through that informative process and educational process. And yes, at times, even more than vote, show up at meetings, show up at civic events, and be fully present to make a difference in the nation. Good citizenship. I still believe that. I was raised to believe that. And I still believe that that's the model for most Americans. If you haven't served in the military, you can embrace the gift you've been given by those who served in the military, and you can exercise your freedom responsibly. Fair enough. Let's take that one step further. As followers of Jesus Christ, as individuals who have placed our faith in Jesus as God's Son, God come into the world, God incarnate, God in the flesh, God come to be with us. As individuals who place our faith in Jesus as not only the Son of God, but the Savior and Lord, the one who died on the cross for us, who took our sins upon himself, that we might stand in the presence of God by faith, and be in a right relationship with God. And hear those great words from the Apostle Paul. There is now though, therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. 
Romans 8, 1. For those of us who place our faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and pledge allegiance to Him as Lord, what does it mean for us to be good citizens? Do we simply stop at society's understanding of being a good citizen, which I outlined earlier? Those are, that's a pretty good model. Be informed. Take a stand. Put yourself second, your country first. Vote and get involved. That's a good model. But are there additional requirements for those of us who follow Jesus? Well, let's just briefly look at what the Apostle Paul had to say in this letter to the Philippian church. The summary statement, if you will, from this passage is simply this. Our citizenship is in heaven. The Apostle Paul tells the Christians there in the Philippian church that your citizenship is in heaven. And that informs everything you do on earth. Because, and if you want to follow along with the outline in your bulletin and take notes, you're invited to do so. Because the first note is simply this. As followers of Christ, we are citizens of heaven and residents of earth. We are citizens of heaven and residents of earth. What does that mean? simply this it means that heaven is eternal and this world is temporary this world that we're living in created by God and called good is nevertheless marred and scarred by sin and as a result this world is passing away and one day this world will pass away it is a temporary place now, we don't know when that's going to be, but we know that not only from the Scripture and from prophecy, we know that from science and nature. This is a temporary dwelling place. And you and I, who have the great gift of living on planet Earth, are here for a short time as well. Because unless the Lord should come in our lifetimes, you and I are going to have come to a point just as my uncle came to a point this past week where he said farewell to this world. And we're going to say, say farewell to it because, again, we are residents of this world. The word resident means that you reside somewhere, but it doesn't carry a permanent connotation. Citizenship in the Bible carries a permanent connotation. So here's the reality. Our citizenship, if we are in Christ, our citizenship is in heaven, our residence right now is on earth. And that's the perspective that the Apostle Paul tells us we are to have as followers of Christ. That's the overarching perspective. Our supreme citizenship is in heaven. And the Apostle Paul taught the early Christians to be good citizens of the world. You can find it throughout the pages of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul wrote a good portion of the New Testament, and he wrote it by way of letters. Letters to various churches, and in some cases to people. And those letters were collected, and they are now you know, a major part of the New Testament. And you can read the letters of Paul and, and come away clearly with the impression that Paul wanted followers of Christ to be good citizens in the world. He wanted that. More than once he admonished people not to be rebellious against the authorities, nor to necessarily be troublemakers or rabble-rousers or to give anyone the impression that Christians wanted anything other than what was best for their cities, their communities, and for the Roman Empire, which at that point was in charge. And remember, when the Bible, the New Testament was written, the Roman Empire was in charge. They didn't have elections. They had Caesar. Caesar didn't feel like he needed to be elected to anything. Caesar ruled from Rome. And they ruled by might through the Roman legions. 
very different experience of citizenship than what we experience today. Oftentimes, Rome could be cruel. Oftentimes, Rome could challenge Christians. But the Apostle Paul said, live as good citizens. Live as good citizens. Don't give the government any reason, any reason to think that the faith that you have is somehow a threat to it or to others. Because your mission in this world is to spread that faith. And you don't need to hinder it unnecessarily. So the Apostle Paul wanted followers of Jesus to be good citizens. That's not the question. He just wanted us to remember that our supreme citizenship that informs everything is our citizenship in heaven. Which we have not by birth certificate, not by passport document or green papers. We have citizenship in heaven because of a cross. So if we have our supreme citizenship in heaven, what does that mean in practical terms? Okay? Or as they say back in West Virginia, when the rubber meets the road, that's not a bad Indiana thing either now that I think about it. When the rubber meets the road, what does it mean? Okay. Well, Paul uses this phrase, our citizenship is in heaven. And that word citizenship is interesting. Now, the New Testament was written in Greek original Greek. So the actual Greek word that the Apostle Paul is using here is pol polituma. Polituma. Believe it or not, it comes over into English as politics. Polituma. Politics. Paul's literally saying our politics is in heaven. And here most of us thought we'd get away from it once we got there. Actually, that's, that's not exactly what he means. Because in the Greek language, just like in the English language, one word can mean different things. For example, if you grew up in the 70s, like I did, the word bread can have more than one meaning. I need some bread. Go to the store and buy a loaf. Or it could be, I need some bread, man. That's somebody wanting money. Could mean two different things. And so you have to understand the use of the term in context. So here's Paul saying, well, our politics are in heaven. What in the world does that mean? It could mean one of three things. I'm going to give you the three things very quickly. You can write this down in your outline. First of all, it could mean colonization. Could mean colonization. Our colonization is in heaven. What does that mean? Well, the Philippians would understand. You see, the Philippians were located in a, an area that the Roman Empire considered strategic. Rome had occupied Greece, which at one time had been the most powerful country and nation in the world. And Rome had a particular interest in making sure that Greece didn't try to rise up in rebellion. So you know what Rome did. Rome told its soldiers, its veterans, listen, when you retire, we'll give you a grant of land, but we're going to give you a land out on, on the edge of the empire. You go there, farm that land, and take your family, and you colonize that area for us. So the Philippians were very much aware of this reality. Roman soldiers had been coming to that area for a good while. They had been given land there in reward for their service to the Roman Empire and they would come and they would set up their farms and they set up a, a town, literally the town of Philippi or Philippi. In the Greek it's Philippi but there's a town in West Virginia called Philippi and we all know West Virginians know the language better than anybody so there you go. But they established that, and it was a Roman colony. It's a Roman colony. In other words, those Roman soldiers who put a 
home there in the area known as Philippi. When they were there, they lived as Romans. They walked as Romans. They talked as Romans. They dressed as Romans. They carried Roman culture and Roman values. That was an outpost of Rome. When you went to the town of Philippi, you felt like you were coming into a little part of the city of Rome. In the middle of nowhere. Our citizenship is in heaven. Paul may very well be telling us that you and I are supposed to be a colony of heaven here on earth. Did you know that? Your home, if you're in Christ, your home should be a colony of heaven on earth. And this church, this church is supposed to be a colony of heaven on earth. We're supposed to be a little bit of God's kingdom set up right in the middle of planet earth. And we live and talk and walk and share and minister as citizens of heaven. Our supreme citizenship. So you and I are called to be colonists. And you know, if you think about it, in keeping with the history of our country, that's not a bad thing. Our country was founded as colonies. The 13 original colonies that were English, they were a little bit of England brought over into a new world. Even on our southern border, Spain and southwest and west, uh, Spain set colonies, a little bit of Spain in these areas. You and I are to be colonies of heaven in this world. And think about it. What would our nation look like? If all the churches throughout our nation took it upon themselves to be truly and sincerely colonies of heaven. Jesus said you are to be salt and light and leaven into the world. What kind of leavening influence would that be? Is if, is if, if all of us who are called by the name and the cross of Christ, if we, if we live as citizens of heaven, if our homes are colonies of heaven, if our churches are colonies of heaven, if we're a little bit of heaven right here on earth, what difference would that make? You know something? It'd make a whale of a difference. And it would contribute to the good of our country. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our, we're colonists of heaven, in other words. We're colonists of heaven. But the second aspect is community. The second meaning of this word is community, if you want to write that down, community. Our community is, is in heaven. What does that mean? It means we need each other as Christians. What's the first thing Jesus did when he started his public ministry? What's the first thing he did? Not what he said, but what he did. First thing he did, he gathered disciples. Put together a community. Folks, being a Christian is a part of being a community. Bottom line, even the Lone Ranger needed Tonto. We need each other. And, and, and if, you don't, if you don't want to look at it in religious terms, can I take a minute and look at it in practical terms? If you're an American citizen, you are a citizen of this country, and you say to yourself, you know, I'm sick of the way the country is. I'm going off in the woods and living by myself. I'm not having anything to do with anybody else. I'm going to have my life, my way, and I want everybody to leave me alone. Leave me alone. How is that good citizenship? How is that good citizenship? Are you contributing anything to the welfare of the nation? To the future of our society? No, you're only interested in yourself. You're not making a contribution. Brothers and sisters, as important as it is for you to have an individual, personal relationship with Jesus Christ, understand that Christ died to put you in a part of a larger community. And we need each other. Now, we need each other. And here's the thing. We don't have to like each other. We just have to love each other. We're not all going to see things the same way. We're not all going to have the same opinions or the same preferences. And, you know, as the old story goes, if you ever manage to find a perfect church, well, don't bother going because the minute you're there, you're going to make it imperfect. 
you aren't going to find a perfect church. Churches are spiritual hospitals where people are getting better. The real, that's the real way to evaluate a church. Not how many sinners and gossips and hypocrites are in that church. It's how many sinners are getting better. I want to go to a hospital with a success rate. If I go to a hospital that's full of sick people and they're all getting better, I'd sure rather be there than a hospital full of well people who aren't doing a thing. I want to know people's lives are being changed. And Christ calls us to live in community. So as our citizenship is in heaven, we are not only to live as colonists in this world, but we're to live with other Christians who are doing the same thing. Colonists of heaven so that together we're stronger than we are individually. And that brings us to the last word, last word. The last word is conversation. There are conversation. There are some Bible versions that actually translate this scripture from Philippians where Paul says our citizenship is in heaven. They literally use the word conversation. Our conversation is in heaven. Conversation. What does that mean? Simple. Supposedly, Ben Franklin said politics is the art of the possible. And politics means that two people have to be able to sit down and talk. And so too, if we are to be citizens together in a nation, we need to talk. I might stop preaching and go to meddling here for just a minute. It worries me in our country that more and more we are limiting who we talk to. I might disagree with you politically. But if I let my politics keep me from having a civil conversation with you, It's also going to keep me from sharing the good news of my Savior Jesus with you. I'm not saying you have to give up your political convictions. I'm just saying as Christians, we need to know when to check them at the door. And remember that our supreme citizenship is in heaven where we await a Savior. And we don't await him alone. Conversation. Our conversation is in heaven. And that means that as citizens of heaven who are residents in this world, you and I are to be in conversation with each other and with people in the community about Jesus. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you that you have more potential to reach the 8,000 people in the immediate vicinity of this building who do not currently go to church or evidence any commitment of faith. You have more opportunities and more likelihood of reaching those people than I do through your conversation. People come to church because they were invited. People get involved in church because they were invited and had a friend sit with them and interest them in it. People begin to understand the faith because they have a conversation with someone who's been in the faith for a while and can help them. We individually as a church have to be in conversation with our community. And as we talk with them and listen to them, They'll give us an opportunity to talk to them about Jesus. And we desperately need that to happen. And I, as a pastor, desperately need you to do that. I've spent 32 years doing this, folks, and I will tell you that I learned a long time ago. I can preach my heart out, pray my heart out, and administrate my heart out and pastoral care my heart out and just about do everything that gives my heart out and nothing I do will ever have the impact of your excitement about your faith 
and you're sharing it with the people God brings in your life in timely places and timely events to hear it. People will listen to preachers. They will believe you. I can't believe after 32 years I have to acknowledge that and say that. But it's true. Preaching isn't exactly the profession it used to be. Once upon a time, preachers had a sort of a, a standing in a community. Now we're lucky if we get sitting in a community. And people have started seeing us as just one more in the long group of people who are interested in making a sale or finding a way to make a dollar or fulfill some sort of celebrity, secret desire to be a celebrity. We are seen with suspicion best I can do as a pastor is to train and equip and help you to get excited about the Savior who loved you so much he died for you and to give you the tools you need to figure out a way to share that with others in conversation well that's it that's what citizenship in heaven is all about at least from a biblical standpoint Paul is saying our citizenship is in heaven and so our job is to colonize planet earth while we're here starting with where we are as families and as a church we're to colonize and we are to be in community with each other and lean on each other and rely on each other and we are to be in conversation with the people around us so that they will hear the good news of Jesus Christ the church is always one generation away from extinction, you know. It's up to us. Today we honored individuals who are willing to give their lives for something greater than themselves so that this country and its freedoms can go forward. This morning, as followers of Christ, will we give our lives to something bigger than ourselves, namely the gospel of Jesus Christ. And will we do what we can to make sure until that great and glorious day when Christ comes in final victory, the church will go on, the message will endure, lives will be changed, and there will always be a little bit of heaven here on earth. Let's pray together. Lord God, in these moments, I, I don't so much give an altar call to come to this place as I do give a call to go to your world. These individuals who stood before us bravely gave of themselves to go where they were sent. And our calling is to go where you send us. This afternoon, to our homes, to our neighborhoods, tomorrow to our businesses, our workplaces. As we go forth, Lord, let us go forth remembering that we're called to be good citizens, but the best way we can be citizens of this country we love is to be supremely citizens of your kingdom of heaven that you've opened to all through Jesus Christ. So, Lord, that's the invitation this day from your word, and we will hear it, and we will respond in faith. And Lord, after this service, if there are those who perhaps want to know more about what it means to follow Jesus, I hope that they'll stay, linger, mingle, because I'll be here, and I'll be here as long as need be, to talk, to converse, have conversation with anyone who wants to talk about Jesus. As we go forth on this 4th of July week, Lord, I know there are going to be those who are going to be traveling, those that are going to be off for the weekend. I pray a blessing upon this family as this family travels and this family celebrates and this family engages. May you keep them safe. May you keep them well. May you keep them together. May they be blessed. And may you continue to bless the country whose birth we celebrate this nation we love. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Happy 4th of July. God bless you. And I'll see you next week. Amen. <laughs>